My name is Nayaswami Jaya, and it's been some years, probably more than five, that, <laughs> that I've been to Dallas. And, but uh, so one of these days, one of these days again. So we're going to get you. We're going to get oh, you. Uh, <laughs> as as you're available. <laughs> well, we'll see. We'll see. Now, here, let's let's begin with the prayer, and then we'll do our discourse for today, and then afterwards we'll we'll have time for some uh, for question and answers, unless I keep chatting too long. We'll see. So let's begin with the prayer. Divine Mother, Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father. Friend, Friend, beloved God. Friend, beloved God. Great masters of self-realization. Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. Babaji Krishna. Babaji Krishna. Lahiri Mahashai. Lahiri Mahashai. Swami Sri Teshwar. Swami Sri Teshwar. Great master Paramhansa Yogananda. We humbly bow to you all. We humbly bow to you all. Guide us in our lives so that we always perform the right action. Guide us in our lives so that we always perform the right action. That we always be in tune with thee so that we understand and are in thy vibration. So that we understand in thy vibration. May we live in thy joy. May we live in thy joy. May we perform all actions in thy joy. May we perform all actions in thy joy. May we represent thy joy to all whom we meet. May we represent thy joy to all whom we meet. Om Shanti Shanti Amen. Well, now the, again, thank you for inviting me, Maitri Supriya. It's uh, it's always a joy to. I, uh, not, years and years ago, in the 1990s, I was appointed, asked to be the coordinator for meditation groups, uh, centers, and non centers in the United States. And I would travel more often in those days. I'd go from one to the other, and uh, Dallas, of course, was one of the stops on that. And it was always so fun to be sort of on the regular. Uh, being able to see people in that way and uh uh but since that since uh, for many years then I, I ended up in the east coast of america and then i ended up in india where much of my last uh, 20 years has been and i've uh, been in india but now i'm at the nanda village so who knows maybe i will be able to uh come uh once in a while now i wanted to talk today about this this subject of i saw it was uh, right action and of course, every year, and we have at least one or two readings uh, every year from the Rays of the One Light about the story of Martha and Mary and, and the attitude and uh, of proper attitude for that. And so I was trying to think, what, how can I, what might be a entry point into this subject? And I remembered the, I, some week or two, three ago, I, all of you know, I think, Swami Sagar, who has come down to Dallas from time to time. He's part of the online with Ananda Sangha, and uh, he gets people right into him with letters and requests for answers for question and answers online. And he sent one to me because he was sort of pondering how to answer this person. And he sent me a letter and I'm going to I'll get into that letter in a little bit uh, uh, more. But uh, the the gist of it was, is the person was asking, is it proper to pray for oneself? Now you think, you know, in terms of illness, then of there, of course, then he even extended, well, what about praying for other people? And there was a certain, might my prayers for myself, might my prayers for other people even interfere with divine will and might they interfere with karma and should I basically and I, I feel a little this person was expressing some reluctance or hesitancy on that and and um, now I'll you know I'll, there's a number of parts to that but I thought I'd start just discussing something with uh, a story it, it related a story and I ended up discussing this little bit with Sagar but I thought it was a good discussion and I wanted to share it with you because it does in this sense, it does encompass this um, 
uh, topic of what's the right action in this case prayer and it could be you know thinking well of others and so on and a master uh, he told this story he says there was once upon a time uh, there was a saint who fell ill and he was ill and his the saint's disciples pleaded with him and they would say something like master uh, you've healed so many people by your personal intercession and your prayers why don't you pray to the divine mother uh, to so for your own healing too and so the the saint, he thought about this, and it seemed to him like not a bad idea, and he so he accepted the suggestion, and he, he prayed to Divine Mother for to be healed personally. And, but then when he prayed, because he was a great saint, you see, and when he prayed, the Divine Mother appeared to him in vision, and she says to him, uh, of all things, and, you know, she was rebuking him, is of all things, you who have realized your oneness with the infinite and have so many bodies you live through and want now by praying for this little one form to limit yourself to it for shame. <laughs> <laughs> and the saint, you know, the saint was mortified, of course. He was deeply regretful. Now, I don't know if it's a true story, but it put the point. <laughs> but he says the, deep, the saint was deeply regretful and for his heir, and he prayed, Mother, Mother, you, you, your love alone is all that I need. And he, he reformed himself. And, uh, you know, she was, now does that mean that we should never pray for ourselves, for our own healing? Well, no, there might be, you know, I think we want to talk about that a little bit. But uh, as an example, you see, this man was a self-realized saint. He lived through many bodies. He didn't identify. And his praying for himself, he might say, identified himself with that one particular body, the one particular uh, instance. And so, in a sense, there's a certain relativity here. You know, it's you, you, not all people are, are the same. They don't have the same realization. And so, for the saint, it was, it was a step down. But does that mean it's for all of us? Well... That's what we have to decide, each of, each of us. I do know, though, that Swami Kriyananda, he didn't pray for himself. He was, he didn't, uh, you know, he aspired, he didn't pray for himself. But that, that but I want to make it a point, it's, it's not to say it's a bad thing to do to pray for oneself. Uh, and I'll clarify that in a little bit. But, uh, but uh, there are, there might be reasons why you do want to pray for yourself, such as, uh, Maybe if you pray for yourself, if you're sick, you can't serve very well. And you want to, and your thought is not so much that you want to be well, but you want to serve. For the sake of others, in other words, maybe it's a good thing to pray for yourself that you would be well. There's some reason, altruistic reason, not personal. Maybe that might be a qualifying uh, uh, consideration. And but even if you simply want to feel better, it's not necessarily a bad thing. It's relative. And I, I, I say this because Swamiji used to comment about the uh, the Vedas. And he said the very act of appealing to a higher power reminds us not to, to rely upon God rather than that our own powers alone. You're including God in something. So in that sense, it could be it's a good thing. Uh, to that degree, and he commented how in the Vedas, you in the old ancient texts, thousands of years old, you find all these prayers that are on the surface are very materialistic. You know, you want pray for wealth, pray for a good for a good wife, uh, uh, pray for victory in your battles or whatever it might be. And there, it's it's. It's, it's, and I think most people often you go to the temples in India and in, in church here, people are praying. And what are they praying for? They're praying, oh gosh, my business success, you know, I'm, I'm on the verge of bankruptcy, I need to succeed, or I want to have, you know, might the, might the Dodgers win the World Series, or whatever it might be in our own personal life. <laughs> you know, their, their, their prayers are, let's say, less than the highest. And is that a bad thing? And it's the same thing with the Vedas. And, and Swami said, well, it's all relative because here it's better to pray materialistically, if that's the level that you're on, than to not pray at all, because you're at least including God. And it's a recognition that God's also a part of the equation. And to just, uh, and so yes, you, you, so it's a relative thing. But of course, when once one reaches a certain level, it's like Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane. You say, thy will be done. And you, you call on God. 
And to God, and even Christ, it says in the Bible, he says, if, let this cup pass from me, if it be thy will, thy will be done, not my own. And rather than I'm in control and I'm alone and in control of my destiny, and I don't need any other help. That's the attitude of a very worldly person. So if you're, it's, a, it's a recognition that you do need help. This is good. But he didn't pray for himself. And there was a story, uh, Swamiji, and the story was in years ago that uh, this might have been in the early 1970s. He was giving a Sunday service. He was about to give a Sunday service. He hadn't yet come to the temple to do it. He was in his uh, residence, and he he developed uh, he had developed that morning a kidney stone. And he was in you know if you ever had a kidney stone, it's very uncomfortable, and in this case it was very painful. And he was he just didn't think how in the world am I going to do this Sunday service with this kidney stone? And he just realized he just couldn't do it. But he didn't. He said all the people were there, and he didn't like to. I mean, it wasn't his his uh, style to just say, I'm going to cancel this because I'm in pain. It wouldn't be, you know, he wouldn't do that. And so anyway, he so what he did, he says, Divine Mother, you know my situation. I mean, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do this service. If you want me to do this Sunday service, you're going to have to help me. And he was asking for help, you see. He was asking for help for a very good reason, too. And so then he said, when he said that prayer, he says, immediately, very soon after, he saw the pain dissolved. But not only did the pain go away, but it was replaced by a deep, deep joy. And the joy was so great that when he came up, and I was actually at that Sunday service, he came up and he had a, a he might say a, a light around him, and metaphorically, there was light. And he started to talk and he couldn't talk. He was so in bliss and so in joy. He just, he kept trying to talk and try to talk, and he says, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I can't do the service today. I just feel so much joy. And he could say that was his Sunday service because everybody was very inspired. He didn't really explain why he was in joy at that time, but later on he did. And, uh, but he did, so he didn't really ask personally, you know, please make the pain go away. He just said, I, I want to do this service, but I can't. If you please help me, if it's your, if it's thy will, and but they, I think all the great ones, the great, the great saints, this is their attitude, and that uh, he was praying with the thought, "Thy will be done." And but in reference to the letter that Swami or that uh, Sagar got, uh, there was some, there was something more. There was, there was uh, more to it that I. You know, I, I did. I answered on that level, but there was sort of more to it. It was, in a sense, when we pray, what we're doing is to pray for others, not not to necessarily speak of ourselves. But when we pray to others, it's a good thing to do. The we're instruments of that divine will. It's Thy will, God, be done. So when you pray for others, you pray for healings. It's best not to say, "Oh, it's maybe they have, let's say, they have a certain particular malady in the body." You know, the, the temptation is to pray for that particular malady, and that's, that's okay. But you should then back off a little bit and say, thy will be done. Because we don't know, maybe there's something deeper going on there. And that is maybe just one thing, but it's the overall blessing for that purpose. God, you know, you know what that person needs. Provide that. Now you can give a suggestion, of course, but yeah, but it's, it's thy will be done. <laughs> One, <laughs> so, but it also, in a sense, I, I think this. I, I felt that this question that this person had asked: uh, Are we interfering? It's sort of an. Uh, it's sort of a, a misunderstanding that we that we are not part of the equation. We are part of the equation. We are part of God's will. God uses us, our will, our little will to accomplish through our will, great things can be done. And we open ourselves to be an instrument when we pray for other people. It's not us personally that is, you know, in the healer, God's the healer, but we of course can be instruments for that. And praying and to in praying for others, 
we, if done properly, we forget ourselves actually. So it's a very beneficial thing for ourselves to pray for others, is to forget our little self in that. But there was even another something I felt that this, uh, this person was asking, and I think it was the more important part of the letter. He said, should we pray for our own healing? And then he went on to say, should we pray for the healings of others? Will we not by that action interfere with God's will by doing that? If I'm, if I get myself involved, well, one, it seems to me a little presumptuous that we're going to interfere with God's will. <laughs> My will, God, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm intruding on God's will, but that aside, it, it, it seems to me it's an, it's to, by my acting in life, I'm somehow going to uh, interfere with divine will. So the implication is, well, I shouldn't do anything. Why do anything? Whether we pray or withhold, whether I pray or whether I withhold my prayers, both are actions. It's not as if praying for another person is an action and not praying for that person is a non-action. Both are choices, both are actions. And it's a bit of a philosophical sophistry, really. It's a clever, in other words, it's a clever argument. And my advice to Sagar was, uh, I gave him general advice, but then I said, refer to the master's teachings in the Bhagavad Gita, where he's talking about action versus non-action. Because I think this person who wrote that was tempted to not act. But the fact of the matter is, it's not possible to not act. Refusing to pray for somebody is also an action. And so I'd like to read uh, something, a paragraph that Swami wrote in, in reference to one of the slokas in the Bhagavad Gita, not the one that we had for today, but it's something very similar. And Krishna says in the Gita, he says, perform, and, and it answers this question of what is right action. Perform those actions which your duty dictates, for action is better than inaction. Without action, indeed, even the act of maintaining life in the body would not be possible. And Master went on to say, even breath is an action, and, and there's a certain element of will in that. It's on a very subconscious level, because we don't think about it, but there's a, everything that we do is there's an is a willful action, and so Swamiji, the commentary he says is, the solution is not to refrain from acting in life. You know, people think, should I act or not? Am I going to interfere with divine will? The, the solution is not to refrain from acting. Some people, many hermits, for example think to develop spiritually by refraining from all actions. You know, they want to go up, get away from it all, you know, and not involve themselves in this messy world. He says, that idea is a delusion. As long as one must breathe, think, and move, he cannot rightly claim to be inactive. The yogi who sits breathless and motionless in samadhi is a different case. To go beyond action, you must merge your consciousness in the cosmic sound of Om, allowing it to act through you and around you until you merge into that infinite vibration, and then pass beyond vibration itself into the calm consciousness of the Supreme Spirit. As long, however, as you are conscious of having a body, you will only be deceiving yourself if you try to achieve the actionless state by not acting, all you will become in time is lazy and dull-minded. <laughs> I like that last sentence. But so in other words, so to summarize what he's saying, as long as we're, we are bound in this ego, in other words, as long as we're identified with the body, we have to act we, because we're, we're, we are acting in the consciousness as I'm the doer. And this is, of course, what we're trying to transcend. I, Jai, am doing this or I'm doing that or the other thing. And as so long as I see myself the doer, I'm identified with this body and I create karma. 
karma is created when one is identified with the body. If I can act when I'm not identified, if I'm in a state of uh, Jivan Mukta or of the masters, then I don't really create karma. I act in this, but it's not attached. That karma is attached as long as there's ego. But the, so the question is not whether we should act or not act. The question really is how to act, how to act, what's the right way to act. Uh, since we must act, why not act in the right way? And so this person who, who was thinking about, oh, I, I don't want to act, I don't want to pray for others because I might interfere. Now, you could say that about anything in life. I don't want to interfere with, interfere with God's uh, creation, you might say. I'm not going to act. It's impossible. You have to act. The real question is, what's the right way to act? In a way that's free, and ideally, the answer would be act in a way that's free, that's in God in God contact and act in a way that's that you're not acting from ego you're acting from a higher plane of wisdom you're acting in attunement uh God with God and and this is the way we want to, this is of course what the spiritual path is to forget this little self and act in the spirit of God consciousness and then we come back to Martha and Mary of course the story of Martha and Mary Martha was acting she was busy acting, you know, her, her Martha, Martha, thou art busy with many things. Whereas Mary chosen the better part and she had, she was acting, she was trying to be in tune with divine in at tune with Jesus' consciousness. And in that, and didn't, and as Swami says, it doesn't mean that she didn't later act, but act in that attunement, not busy, just busyness itself may bring you good karma and it's not it's not that we shouldn't avoid action. We have to do, we have to act. And so if, um, since that was Martha's house, it was probably her job to be the host, you know, and, and to, but she did it in the wrong consciousness. She was looking at, you know, other, what others weren't doing rather than what she was doing and what she was doing, trying to do it in the best way possible. And then, and the best way possible was not necessarily to get everything perfect outwardly, the best, best way possible was to do it in the consciousness of that attunement that Mary had chosen. And so this is, a, this is and for ourselves as well, you can't avoid action just by turning your back and thinking you can escape it. Life is facing us in every moment. Our dharma, you might, we have to do our dharma. We often say this and people say, well, what's my dharma? Probably it's what's staring you in the face right at this moment. <laughs> you have to do that in the best way possible. And then the larger, the larger quote unquote Dharma will take care of itself if you take care of the moments and act in the right consciousness with what's ever right before you right now, whatever the situation is right now. Act in the highest and try to act in them because you have a choice in everything. There is choice. You can, you, and should I, am I acting in a joyful way? And am I acting in a peaceful way? Am I, am I being a channel? And that is your choice. Now, there's a, you could go into, and there's probably another Sunday service uh, topic, the balance between free will and karma. Is there such a thing as free will? And that's a very philosophical question and I won't go into, but I will summarize it and say, we don't, karma rules as long as we're identified with this body, with this ego, karma rules and our actions are outward actions of what we do are to a large degree karmically dictated, but not completely. There, you could say in every person, there's an impulse. It's a primal impulse in all creation to aspire towards something higher. And the master based his whole teachings upon this, the, the desire in every soul to seek happiness. That's a primal instinct to move to the light. The plant in your windowsill is expressing that when the leaves, they follow the light. And that's an aspiration, you could say, on a very low level. But in the same way, we're not that much different. We follow the light as well. The light attracts us. And that's the choice, the primal choice that we make in every situation in life act in a such a way that you're moving toward the light. You're moving and you're acting, 
you want joy, you want bliss, you want peace, and you do, you react and act in those ways that express that to the light and away from the darkness, toward expansion and avoid, and as opposed to contraction, toward joy and away from sorrow. This is what, that's, a, that's the primal instinct within creation itself, is to expand and move toward that light. And so right action can't be described uh, in outward performance, because everybody's slightly different. Each person must do their own dharma. And we're all, it's on the scale, we're all somewhere on that scale. And what's right for one may not exactly be right for the other, but all of us can move directionally towards something higher. We can, we can express ourselves in a better way. And then this consciousness, if we can act in that consciousness toward this aspiration towards something higher, then we find little by little we become in tune. We become an instrument for the, the, the divine, you could say, can work through us. We've opened our heart to be an instrument for something higher. We aspire to something higher. And if that's our intention, so you could say much of right action is based. What is your intention? Your intention to do the best. It doesn't escape, you don't escape karma necessarily because, you know, the, what is the old saying, you know, the road to Hades is paved with good intentions. You saw, you could, because your intentions could be great because it, it could be a bad decision, but you intended well. So in a sense, it's a mitigating factor. And, and if you intended well, you did the wrong, maybe the wrong thing in some way, you're going to learn your lesson. And then it's in a sense, it's progressive and you move, you're moving toward the light as you un, as your ability to understand that light allows you to but don't move by yourself i think this is this you might say the lesson that we doing right action to think that we can parse out all the variables in this world and figure it out which is the right perfect thing for me to do right now we don't know but if we're in, if our intention is moving to the light, or tension is moving toward joy, we say, God, this is what I think I'm gonna. This seems like the best way. I, my intention is to be with you, to serve you, not my little self. Thy will be done. Guide my will in everything. My will, my actions in everything I do. And you could say your fallback position because you may be choosing wrong in a logical sense but if you're trying your best and you bring god into the equation with you you could say that yes you may stumble along the way but you could say the karma involved in those stumbles is going to be much much less if you're intentionally going in the other way that it's much more difficult the sorrow and the suffering that comes from that karma is much more difficult than you might say sticky, harder to get rid of and overcome. And so, and, uh, so that, uh, so th much of this, 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 much of this is just what life is about. What action takes us upward in our consciousness? God reminding activities, things that bring us back into that state of consciousness and things that uh, uh, bring harmony and all of the various virtues that we learn, what, what promotes those? And let us be an instrument for that. And, but let us do it in such a way that we're being representatives of the divine. And as all of us here, or at least probably most of us here are also disciples, so great guru, Paramahansa Yogananda, act in such a way that you're trying to serve. If you act in a, in a spirit of service, you're trying to serve and be an instrument for something higher uh, in your in your life, Master said. I think it's one of his really keys to understanding his teachings and how to achieve what he wants for us. He said, "If you want to be in tune with me, which is what we do, that's we're seeking as devotees, we're seeking as disciples, attunement with Guru, with God." He says, "If you want to be in tune with me, serve my work." Now. 
on the surface, you could say, okay, that's doing something outwardly, organizationally, handing out, you know, preaching, handing out pamphlets, whatever. It didn't mean it like, I mean, it's, it, that's not a bad thing. It could be a good thing. But serve my work means being an instrument for the Guru's vibration and channeling that vibration in everything we do. And this is, of course, what Mary had discovered. She was trying to attune herself with Christ consciousness, with the Christ, and thereby be in, in attunement with that. And to be in tune with the Guru is the fastest and the quickest way to God realization, because we allow the Guru to work through us. And we find that rather than us, our little ego, being the motivator and the decider, we find that there's a high, we bring a higher power into our day-to-day -day life. And so when we ask the question, uh, what's the right action? And Martha might have thought this, or he says, it's not just to sit at Jesus' feet with a restless mind and, uh, you know, to the mind going hither and there. It wasn't the outward thing that Mary was doing uh, because Martha could have sat there, and but Jesus would not have been particularly pleased if the consciousness was not there for it. So we have to, you could say, put our, the right action of Mary is to be like Mary. We put ourselves in tune with the Guru. We put ourselves in tune with the teacher. and the, We put our, ourselves in tune with Christ. And then in that consciousness, to the degree that we can, we then act and do whatever it is that we have to do. Our Dharma, our duty, our responsibilities, whether it be a household, whether it be education, whether it be, you know, court, working in a corporation, we do what we need to do, but we do it in the right spirit. And somehow, somehow, when we act in that way, we, we actually have an influence on circumstances. Now, this sounds superstitious in a little ways, and it'd be hard to logically prove this to a non-believer, but we, as an instrument of divine consciousness, actually have an impact upon circumstances around ourselves. There's a certain magnetism. We begin to attract circumstances, situations, solutions that are in harmony with our own state of consciousness. The world, we're not separated from the world. We're part of the larger world. We're part of God's will. We're, and it responds in that way. And so you find if you're, you know, Yogananda, you say some people have commotion karma and they're always, everything's just always falling apart around them. And he would tell them, he says, well, you've, you know, it's your magnetism. He would tell people sometimes, take a break, take six months off, don't drive a car if you're <laughs> prone to accidents, change your magnetism. And by putting ourselves in tune with the higher power, our magnetism actually changed and actually the world around us begins to conform is that chant Ram Tirtha chant the, the world stands aside and makes room for me. It's not egoic that chant. He was saying it just responds. The world will respond. The world opportunities will open up that weren't there before based upon our own individual magnetism. So take that to heart. Take that to heart. What's right action for you? for me, and it's to do my highest, think joyfully, choose joy rather than disharmony, choose peace and calmness rather than restlessness in everything we do in all of our actions. And we'll find that's the secret of right action, bringing God into the picture as well. So I want to, uh, we're going to conclude here. I want to open this up. Maybe some of you have questions. Maybe we can uh, discuss this a little bit further. And um, and it could be with that, you know, ideally, I guess, you know, because this is our subject today, we might want to keep it on this topic. But if it wanders, that's okay, too. I'm fine. And uh, Maitri and, and yeah. Priya, I, I hand it back to you to be my, okay. my um, 
whatever it is. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll facilitate the questions. Yeah, so, that, that, that's it, because maybe somebody asks a question, but I'm not going to be able to hear it if you don't. Yeah. Well, we're going to um, have a mic. Mark is going to get a mic oh, okay, here. Good. That's good. And so, so if anybody anyway. here, and can we have uh, the larger picture at all? Or we're we going to be able to see people a little bit so he doesn't feel like he's just talking to yeah, if I, if I could see the audience a little bit, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, I think it would be helpful. I can see who's asking the question. And yeah, uh, and then, and then um, also we have a, just a couple people online today, uh, but uh, anybody online, if you want to, you can, it'd be great if you wanted to open your cameras. It's always wonderful. Uh, or you can put your um, questions in the chat and Mark will see them because it's the monitor's too far away for us to see the the chats, but anyway, so anybody uh, you want to, here we go, and you can all wave, hello. Oh, there's a look there, okay. <laughs> uh, it's, it, it's, 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 there's a few people sort of on the periphery too, but uh, anybody have a question you want to come up to the mic and ask, it would be the easiest thing to yeah. do. Yeah, so that's the best, and then I can, so if you would introduce yourself too, I may recognize some yeah. of you, Boy, you're, I'm not sure that unless we get a close-up, I can't quite see who you might be. He'll give you a close-up, too, probably. I can walk close to the camera. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, okay. Now I can see who he's at. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Thanks so much for your talk today. Um, it just uh, fired off a lot of things in my mind. So I don't have so much a question. It's just some connections I made that I'd just like to share. And, um, you know, I'm always, you know, looking at Christian material and looking at the Hindu material and, you know, fascinated or looking for the connections. And I was just thinking as you were talking, you know, we were talking about, you know, that initial question where someone asked whether or not, you know, they would interfere with the will of God. And in a way, you, you answered it quite elegantly. And if you follow thy will be done, if you are in a tune with, you know, the, the higher dharma, then your dharma is aligned with the action of the world. And I guess the things I wanted to add is that I think not often enough do we see ourselves as actually the creative agents of God's will. That, right. Good point. That, that God's creativity manifests through us, and those thoughts that we have in attunement are, are not you know, against God's will. They're actually the expression of God's will through his, his you know, enlightenment of us to make us active in the world. That's um, right. The other thing I just wanted to... to uh, talk about is just that it's almost like that story in the Bible takes the the elements of karma yoga that we find in the Gita and puts them into two different buckets, right? The the activity of Martha on the one hand, and then the alignment of um, of Mary on the other. And as you you know elegantly explained, it's when you know the Bhagavad Gita talks about we must blend those things, right? That's what creates the karma yoga that Krishna teaches us. Yes. Yes, I think the point you made first about the fact that we are channels. All of us are channels. We can't avoid being channels, but the question comes up, what are we channeling? You know, and we can be channels, you know, we can be channels in the sense, in the largest philosophical sense, it's all God's will. Yes, so we're channels of God's will, but God's will can express on many different octaves. And uh, so in a sense, for our own benefit, for the benefit of other people, or we want to we want to channel on a higher oct on a high octave that's useful, that's helpful, that's going to bring harmony rather than you might say the opposite, which sometimes which is possible too, you know, that you know, we get angry at our kids while well, we're channeling something, you know, and and <laughs> but it's not necessarily going to, in a sense, is that God's will? The philosopher might argue, well, it's all God's will. But for practical purposes, uh, I think God is more pleased if we're, the consciousness is more in tune with the higher octaves. And so uh, it's without going into the philosophy of it all, I think it's more practical. And I think, uh, like Swami would say, be practical. Our Master would say, be practical in your idealism, because uh, not just become an armchair philosopher. <laughs> Yeah, and, and then we have that activity to make mistakes because God is forgiving. I mean, you know, we're always trying to align with God's will. We're all trying to be properly creative, but the error is inevitable because we're merely relative. So, but the forgiveness is there. The forgiveness is there. Yeah, you could almost say 
air is somewhat inevitable, almost. As long as we're ego motivated, we're going to get it off a little bit. But we get better, and we get better, and eventually, eventually, it'll we 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 transcend that. So with with God's grace. Thank you for this moment. Okay. Thank you. I, I think that um, sometimes that. Uh, you know, we get better because as we attune ourselves more, it's like our our consciousness gets refined. And, and when we start to do something that is in error, it we feel how it hurts us, you know, and, and, and it hurts it hurts another person. But we're all one and we have more <laughs> sensitivity to the fact that we are not acting in the highest. With, right. And, and there's yeah. just more as our consciousness gets more refined we don't we don't feel to go there or when we start to go there we go oh this just doesn't feel good <laughs> you know you know what i mean whereas before we might give in to that rage or whatever and think oh i feel strong about but you start to feel, you see you know you your your consciousness gets more refined and you go oh no this is harming me and him i mean it's i think i'm harming him and that's a good thing but it's actually harming me you know that yeah. kind of thing it's all it's all a matter of uh you know in the hindu tradition they would in the gita of course they would say it's uh, the, the gunas you got the sattva raja tamas and uh, but even the saint has a certain element of tamas, you know, negativity. And that is like Swami says, you know, a saint, maybe their mind wanders a little bit. To them, that's painful, maybe. And it's or, or if they or they've done some little thing that for the average person it would be trivial. But they're they're at a certain point that well, even that oh, it doesn't feel quite right. And I think that's what you're saying is uh, yeah. you say the the criminal, you know. The mobster or whatever, they don't think of these things. I mean, it's all, you know, they could, they're, they're immune in some sense. And so, you know, a, a person with less understanding might say, well, I want to be like that, immune. But unfortunately, they suffer. You know, yeah. they ultimately, they're suffering. And uh, because that separation from their true nature is ultimately, it's, it's not what they really, their heart really, really wants. So here's Carolyn. She'd like to ask a question. Thank you so much for being with us today. Oh, I can oh, really relate to what you were talking about. I've been in Ananda for less than a decade, uh, but uh, certainly been learning a whole lot <laughs> since I have been here. And uh, I just wanted to ask you, it's actually about a situation I was in, and I do think I did the right thing. It, it seemed odd to me to do that because I'd always taken care of myself in most all business situations. Uh, but I live in a uh, townhome community that where there's an HOA, and I'm sure you know what that is. Mm -hmm. Do you know what a HOA oh, is? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, a homeowners association. Homeowners, yeah, so, yeah, There's homeowners like a, a board to decide what's right and wrong. You got to keep your grass a certain length of height. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> yeah. Well, they had approved a certain situation for me. And uh, then uh, a neighbor started fussing about that. And, you know, then they changed it. And uh, when they changed it, uh, it was, you know, I was being told I just kind of get messages. And I'm sure they're not from my own mind. <laughs> but this one was uh, coming, I felt like from God and Guru, uh, that this was a situation for me to practice forgiveness. And uh, I did that for quite a long time. And at first I felt very odd about it. Why am I not taking care of myself financially or, or whatever? You know, it wasn't how I had acted previously in my life. And um, I kept doing it for about three years. I mean, they really wanted me to learn that. They just, and, and I had never thought I was not forgiving. forgiving. Uh, but I think they just, uh, the powers that be just wanted me to learn more. And I still felt kind of bad what I did because, you know, it, I felt like I wasn't taking care of myself or something. But then I got out of that and, you know, uh, so 
it just was so different how, uh, than how I had always lived. So I just wondered if you had any uh, thing you'd say about that. You know, when you're trying to learn something new and you haven't been doing this your whole life. Well, you did you you know the it was part of the forgiveness was something that was new to you or that particular situation that you were forgiving in uh well uh forgiveness wasn't new to me but apparently uh it was thought from somewhere that i still needed to work on some things and i've been given other lessons since then oh. that, have, that have brought me closer and closer to uh, god and good Ruth. <laughs> Well, just... you're in a you're in a situation where, you know, whether it's an ideal situation or not, where you're being tested and challenged to yeah. be able to one, maybe the you know, there could be many different lessons in that the ability to work harmoniously with other people in a homeowners association can be difficult and trying. Yes, it can be. <laughs> uh, I understand that very well. I mean, I here I live in a an on the village. <laughs> <laughs> and it in some fashion, it's not totally, you know, different or there's a certain, we have to agree. And, but when you're in a homeowner's situation, oftentimes the values upon which you're agreeing about are maybe lacking a little give and take. That yeah, maybe <laughs> in this time <laughs> for sure. <laughs> and I can imagine, because I've read the stories and, uh, you know, how this can work. But you're in the situation and you've probably signed up for those situations and at some point you've agreed to those situations. But I do think that the the people that perhaps are impressing this lesson upon you, I think you need to pray for them, you know, and, and, and make friends. Can you make friends with them so that if they're not see the problem with the homeowners association, it's often it's so very impersonal. Yeah. It's, People don't treat each other or it can tend toward people don't treat each other as friends. That's true. And, yeah. and, and when people can treat each other as, and see each other as friends, they tend to be much more accommodating. And there's a certain, you know, people don't like to get involved on that level because, well, it could be a lot of reasons why they just don't. And, and so consequently, you're, you're being treated in a very impersonal way, according to the rules, according to the written contracts. And you want to, you're a type of person, probably, I'm guessing, since you're here this evening, you're a, a heart, a person who has heart and wants to relate to the people on a, on a little bit more personal level as, as friends. And friends tend to be able to work things out without having to resort to rules. You know, Yogananda used to say too many rules kill the spirit. Yeah. And but, <laughs> yeah. And un but unfortunately, when there's a lack of spirit, friendship is, a, is an example of spirit. When there's a lack of spirit, people then resort to rules because they, you know, they don't want to fight. So they want they resort to rules. But I, I, you're in that situation. And so you have to be accommodating to it. You, I mean, I imagine there's a process to change the rules, but that's probably not what you want to do. But I think in a sense, to the degree that you can make it more on a, on a friendship level and meet the people that have difficulties with you on a friendly level and see if you can find some way to just say, hey, I don't know what the situation is, but uh, you could. Yeah, you could. well, I, it was no use of going into those details. Yeah, but, it, but I think in the sense, if, uh, you know, forgiveness, is a is a tricky thing. It's it it we do need to forgiveness in the sense of seeing everybody as a as a fellow soul in there. But be careful with forgiveness because sometimes you're saying, well, that person is wrong, but I forgive them. You see, and that's that's a limited, little bit limited view because they're they're definitely wrong. And then and and we have to back up a little bit and say, well. We're all in this boat together. I don't yep. necessarily know what, exactly what's right or wrong. They certainly seem to think it's right. Don't seem to think it's wrong. Let's let's work together harmoniously and embrace them. And I think prayer and sending out uh, vibrations. You know, there uh, uh, 
There's a prayer that uh, we use here at Ananda. Maybe you are, it's called the Peace and Harmony Prayer. Lord, mm -hmm. fill, you know, maybe you know that prayer. Fill, fill so and so, fill these people with peace and harmony, peace and harmony, yeah. fill so and so with peace and harmony. You say that 10 times with, with meaning and intention. And then you conclude with maybe, let's say, five times, you, Lord, fill me with peace and harmony, peace and harmony. Lord, fill me with peace and harmony and peace and harmony. And, and, that, and many times people have said by doing that, somehow people tend, uh, resolution tends to come and people back off from being so rule bound and just they be, treat each other as brothers and sisters in God. And that's in a sense, I think the attitude we want to take toward these difficult okay. things. But, but we do live, we live in a society of rules and so, you know, we, we, we can be tempted to be anarchists against those rules, but does it make you happier? What makes you joyful? What can you do that is, keeps your joy level high? Look for that. Uh, well, I so appreciate what you said about the forgiveness. You know, you, it, it's like you're on some high level and they yeah, who, who, yeah. <laughs> you know, I hadn't thought about that at all, but... Uh, it has uh, brought some peace there yeah, because yeah. I, I have a neighbor that was involved right next door and she was all huffy about things and uh, she and I, we, you know, we're not great friends, but we are really, uh, you know, friendly. And yeah. there are a few other people who are civil now, and, <laughs> uh, but, you know, we're not real close. So well, anyway... That no, when I, I said earlier, what's your dharma in life? It's right before you. That neighbor is, <laughs> is, is your dharma, right? <laughs> you know, relating to those people. You know, yeah. how, how can I do this in a spirit that I'm going to feel clean and uplifted and, and yeah. uh, better and be a certain well, be an instrument for some, something higher? Well, thank you. I, I, I also believe, uh, you know, when you get in a situation, uh, if you try to move from that, you just try to move away instead of dealing with all of it. Uh, you know, I have to, if I had moved, I'd ha I still would have had to have taken myself with me. <laughs> yeah. And then I would, have, I would have gotten that lesson in some other area. Uh, yeah. right. that's, the, that, that's how life is, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You can run away or you can deal with it. Yeah. So thank yeah. you so much. Wait, thank thank you. I appreciate all you we'll have just to say. Me, right. Any blessings, so, good luck to you. We have we have just a few more minutes. Is anybody, how about online? Any questions? Anybody want to? Nope, nothing there. How about oh, Eric? Okay, you got to hair. You got to enter. You got to show your face, Eric. Eris, it's Eric. Biscamp. You know, Eric. Hey, Mr. Biscamp. <laughs> good to see you, my friend. Yeah. <laughs> you, you know, I just wanted to say that I bet that if Jesus had written the Bible, he would have extended that Martha Mary story to where Martha came up and said, God, I'm so sorry. But you know, all these thousands of years, everybody has been thinking the same thing about Martha. I'm, I'm hoping that didn't affect her negatively. So I'm sending, I'm extending the story and saying, Martha, God bless you. That's not really my question. But, um, and I'm not even sure what my question is. I, I think there is a little bit there, though, that there's always a little bit more of the story. And, you know, it, we, that's why we don't want to ever hold. It's like my brother. I have a brother, and he used to beat me up when I was young. He was very big, <laughs> and I was very small. But, uh, but all my other brothers would always give him a hard time for it in the later years, and I never did because I never wanted to box him in. And I think that's the one thing I've learned here is keep, and you can only do that if, if you have God helping you keep that open. I never said that to him. I never spoke with him. And I'm not saying his name now. It's just, uh, and he's grown to be such a lovely person. Yep. So I'm sure Martha did as well. <laughs> and I'm sure she was already, she might have had just a really bad day. <laughs> 
Anyway, you know, if, you ever get, if, if you ever tune in to Martha and you want to write the rest of her story, I'll be the first one to buy the book. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Swamiji, well, he was giving some advice to, the, to disciples, and this is in the very early years in his life when he was still with Self-Realization Fellowship to the other monks. And he said, you're going to be accused of things that never happened. And uh, th that never happened. And he says, and don't react to it. Just take it. And because you, you say, well, wait a minute, that's not truth. I want to, you know, and he says, that's sort of a worldly response to it. He says, but the, the, the disciple, and we're all here disciples, and, and uh, you know, sometimes life itself will accuse you of something. And so what? And he says, he says, just take it. It's it's good for your ego. <laughs> so in a sense, poor Martha, <laughs> you know, she probably, she probably, you know, I mean, maybe in a sense, maybe she was the one who was the gainer there because he says, oh, you know, and uh, that, uh, you know, but of course, who knows the story really? And, uh, and, uh, uh, just the fact of being in Christ's presence, my goodness, being a direct disciple, wow. <laughs> she must have been a very, very high soul. And I, you know, it's an interesting thing too, is sometimes uh, the guru, I think, will sometimes test the disciples by poking them a little bit to see how they react. And we really don't know what Mary's, what Martha's reaction was, really. It doesn't really go into it. She might have taken, she might have taken that and it might have been the one thing that really took her over to the, uh, to freedom, you know, it's soul freedom, you know, and, uh, and we, you know, I mean, historically we, we think of Mary as, you know, being more advanced than Martha, but we don't know. We just don't know. And uh, so, but the guru sometimes, the light or the guru or life itself, you know, God itself pokes us to just uh, spur us on and teach us something. So you, if you, it's all about how we take it. Isn't that true? How, yeah. how do you take it? I like the way the, um, the guru pokes us through our fellow disciples. <laughs> uh, <yeah. laughs> Yeah, then you could say, I want a, I want a guru that doesn't have many disciples. <laughs> 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 I mean, they're always poking us. But in the right spirit, you know, it's, it's all for the good. <laughs> uh, well, thank you, Jaya. Did you want to say anything, Supriya? You, no, you know? I, w I was just thinking, and you just said it about living, uh, well, whether it's living at Ananda Village or us having this incredible blessing to have this Sangha house, the beauty of it, you know, for so many years and to have close contact with wonderful blessings of devotees. And yet we do rub up against each other. And I think when we can see it as, um, you know, I can, I can see myself <laughs> right over many years now, if, if when it happens, because it still does sometimes a little bit, if I can respond with either love, with either silence in the moment, and then grow more to love, <laughs> not even forgiveness that someone else is wrong and I'm right, but just see it as another opportunity to to that that God and Guru is trying to help me to lift my consciousness, and I am just so grateful for. Yeah. It's all always about how we. Uh, it's about how we react. Life is life is teaching us every moment, and then yeah, yeah. do we get the um, rest? Of God? I have one other little thing. I just want to see if there. Since you said you were with all the different. Um, uh, colony leaders and what was there anything that came out of that that you would like to share just really briefly in closing that that you guys discussed or inspiration or well this this uh, this one this you know they there are meetings with you know that are you know country limited you know the Americans the Indians they have their own meetings but this is the this is the once a year where we try to get the international uh, people from international so that we can, the focus you could say is we were talking about how do we harmonize our efforts? 
you know, that uh, because uh, in, it, in any large work, there's going to be different ways of doing things, and that's okay. But there's something, it's, it's not about being exactly the same, but it's being in harmony and co cooperation with, with one another so that we're, uh, that we're all moving in the same direction. And that, so there's lots of little issues that come up about that. Uh, in one, especially now that we're in digital age and we can reach people. I mean, I might be, if it's possible, I might be talking to somebody in South America right now or Europe or something. And, you know, how can we keep that sense of uh, expansiveness to do that, but yet, yet uh, be in a cooperative way. And so not to, not to, what I say may have impact uh, I wouldn't be in a satsang like this, but there are other event situations that we have to think globally and, uh, and, and help each other globally and uh, bring down whatever barriers that prevent that from happening. And so we kind of, we kind of talked about that uh, and that sort of self-definition of who we were as a, you know, an organization, as a work, as masters, disciples, and try to you know, just coordinate. It's about coordination more than anything. Mm. And, uh, but, uh, but the day to day things, not too much, not too much. It's more trying to keep the spirit cooperative and harmonious. And, uh, I, one th thing that continually came up was the need for good communication, you know, because mm. you find that lots of times differences come up because we just never communicated. And, uh, and I think that's applicable in organizationally, but it's also applicable individually between people. You know, and they were, like we were saying, you know, sometimes people don't, you know, there's a little differences come up. And, but if you communicate, it builds trust. Oh, I know that person. I, I know my attorney. She does crazy things, but you know, I know her. She's a good person. <laughs> so it's forgiving. You know, I say you trust their intentions. <laughs> Now we didn't say anything about my tree of Riverdale. So <laughs> the, idea being, the idea being, to the degree that we come to know one another and communicate with one another, we immediately trust the other person because we know them. Oh yeah, we know they're a good person. We're trying to do their best. Now organizationally, that's that applies is what we're. That's the level we we're talking on. But I think about it even in a, a sangha like in Dallas. You know, you say, well, now, why did that person do that, that, and that? Well, if you know the person, you think, well, you know, they got good intentions, but I just must not understand the motives or what's going on. And maybe I should communicate <laughs> or, or talk or, and, and, and so good communication on whether it's on a small scale or a large scale will solve a lot of problems. Even in a family, you know, you don't talk to one another, who, you know, you don't, you start losing connection. And so, just communicate. That's that was sort of a a theme, you might say. And how then, of course, you get into, well, how do we do that? You know, how can we facilitate that? And so that's kind of on those levels. Okay. Well, thank you so much. It's just a joy to see you again, and and uh, and and all that you shared with us. So, we t thank you for taking the time to be with us this morning. And we're gonna. Typically, we, we just sign off with a, a Texas goodbye, which uh, we'll oh. do in just a moment. But first, we'll, we'll ohm you, and then we will do our, our little, we all know what that is, I think. Okay, so, well, I'm, 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 now I'm, I'm waiting in bated breath here, so. <laughs> oh, well, <laughs> you might be a little disappointed. <laughs> oh, yeah, well, uh, Mark can Mark can uh, can uh, 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 so here here comes the group yeah oh, okay all right so let's just rub our hands together and sending being channels of light and gratitude and blessings to Jayaji. Oh.
Namaste, y'all!